I don't remember a time during my school years when I wasn't bullied by someone. And that streak ended in college, but by then, all the damage was done. Was I stronger? Perhaps. But I would trade all my strength for a chance at just a normal school experience. I lived in a regular place with enough people that not everyone knew each other, but I was unlucky because my main bullies that I thought of were three of the meanest girls in the world, and they followed me all throughout my formative years. They didn't officially start bullying me until about third grade. I already knew what being picked on was like, but mostly from boys who were just afraid of girl cooties and all of that. But in third grade, my biggest nightmare started. These three girls, who I'll call Janice, Emma, and Gaia, noticed that I liked to draw during recess instead of talking to others or running around the courtyard. The first day, they took one of my drawings and threw it in the trash and then threw juice on it. I can't remember well, but I remember crying like a baby. It wasn't hard to get me to ball my eyes out back then, and that's the main thing with these bullies. The more you reacted to them, the more they push. They were scolded at the time and separated from me, but little mean girls are tough to deter. And for years, I wished at that point that I was a boy, because I saw how boys bullied others and it was mostly just physical. And I wish I could have fought them, but girl bullying is much sneakier and more horrible than that. Now okay, this may be a little reductive to people who have been bullied with physical violence, but that's just how I felt. Like boys could resolve things quickly, whereas I had to play a political game against eight and nine year olds. And I would only learn later that physical bullying wasn't better or easier to take, obviously. Once they noticed that they could get me crying over almost everything, I was their easiest target. I remember everything they did to me, from poking me in class with whatever sharp thing that they could find, to sending me notes with awful insults that picked at my young self-esteem. And I'm sorry, but when you're nine, reading the words, you're so ugly all the boys will forever hate you, it truly affects you. I broke down each time and I couldn't control it, no matter how much I tried. As soon as I started bawling, they started laughing, and would only make me louder. Even my teachers got pretty annoyed with it. They stopped them at first, but eventually they started rolling their eyes and just continued class, sometimes ignoring me. And I guess that was easier than having to send kids to the principal and disrupt their lesson plans every single day. It took around two years to build up enough pain and psychological tolerance to not start crying like a baby every time they did something, but I was still tearing up and that got them going. It spurred them on, and I still have no idea why it was so delightful for them. But it didn't matter that my tolerance for their bullying got better because we started growing up and, to be honest, things only got worse. Everything seemingly wrong that you can have as a teenager, it happened to me. I'm talking braces, bad posture, acne, frizzy and abundant hair, all that. And God, I even had a little mustache going. And although my parents cared enough to get me braces, they didn't think anything else like hair removal was really necessary. Acne and hair are parts of puberty, and my mother would say that. Now PSA, please don't believe that. If your kids tell you that they want to get their mustache or hairy legs waxed, just let them do it. And maybe my life in general would have been better if my mom actually listened to me and allowed it, but... I could have felt better about myself, I guess. Anyway, I had to get used to Janice, Emma, and Gaia's taunts through my most vulnerable times. Now this might sound silly, but someone gave me chocolates one time and I ate them at recess, and I was still figuring out stuff with braces and I thought that I had eaten everything without getting food stuck in my braces. But I did get chocolate stuck and I quickly noticed that that was the plan all along. I went back to class and somehow the girls had gotten one boy, this boy named Julian, to ask me if I liked the chocolates. I remember he was pretty popular so I was shocked and immediately smiled, my chocolate covered bracy smile at him. And everyone started laughing, him included. This happened around the time phones started coming with cameras and I remember they took pictures and I was just mortified. I can't even imagine how I would have felt if those pictures ended up online. 
but if they were only passed around between our peers and they were luckily very low resolution. I cried silently, as I had learned to do, and cleaned my mouth when that period ended. Tons of things like that happen over the years. It was only when we made it to high school that their attitude changed a little. I had learned not to cry at all. It hurt. The ridicule was still terrible. The absolute negligence or just lack of caring of the school staff really tore me up too, but I had finally learned to control my tears. And I learned that bullies can sense, smell, detect fear and pain and low self-esteem. They had messed with me so much over the years that I think that it was just habit for them, but when I stopped crying, they stopped caring. Finally, I would spend days without a single taunt from these girls, or anyone really. I was already known as the loner, a weirdo girl who was always drawing, but no one was messing with me. High school also presented other things for everyone. Janice, Emma, and Gaia developed their own interests like cheerleading, school government, and model UN. And yeah, it sucks, but the truth is that not every bully is just a complete idiot. I had art club, and a lot of us were introverts, so I can't say I made a bunch of friends, but I fit in there somehow. And that made me bolder. Whenever they remembered me, like in the halls or in class, I just simply ignored them. It sounds stupid and simple because that's what adults tell you to do about bullies, but ignoring them wasn't easy and I was glad I managed it. That is until I got a group project with this guy Gaia was interested in. I didn't pick him, I didn't even like him, and I remember his name was Tony. The teacher assigned us together and we only worked at school after hours, and that's how Gaia saw us. We were at the library using the computers there, and the next day... Those girls were on me like they hadn't been in years. They came into the girls' bathroom after me, and I hadn't seen them walking behind me until it was too late, closed the door and pushed me into a stall. Now, I had learned to gray rock them in the past, which is pretty much just ignoring them, but I couldn't with this level of aggression. I fell back onto the toilet and hit my back on the pipe pretty badly. I was trying to recover from the pain when Gaia hit me square in the face with a big algebra book. I yelled at them at last while I was trying to feel if she had actually broken my nose. Gaia got closer and grabbed my hair. She asked what I was doing with Tony, and I told her through harsh breaths that we had been assigned a project. After hearing that, Gaia finally let go of me and right on cue came the worst sound in the world their laughter, and I hadn't heard that cackle in a while. Almost mechanically, I started crying, not just from the pain of the physical blows, but it was also just automatic. I was a little girl again, and they kept laughing and saying things like, of course, Tony could never like a girl like her. Gaia, you should have known that it was something stupid for school. I remember Gaia's smirk and how she said that it didn't matter because I needed to be taught a lesson and how fun it would be to see me cry again. Janice got real close to my face and added, You thought we forgot about you, huh? Well, we didn't. We just have better things to do. The next time you get close to one of our guys, this will be much worse. I remember those words. And our guys. I didn't even know Gaia liked him. I was just sobbing. And finally, someone opened the door. It was a teacher that I hadn't met before, and she asked what was going on, and Emma said that they didn't know. They found me crying in the bathroom and wanted to help, but I wouldn't tell them what was wrong. And the girls left, and the teacher tried to ask what was wrong, but I just kept crying and crying. My mother picked me up and gave me a lecture about getting a call from the school. I wailed that I was bullied and no one cared or believed me, and I got grounded for doing that. I mean, my mom wasn't mean or anything, but she just couldn't understand. And according to her stories, she was popular. I went to school the next day with actual bruises that no one asked a word about. Really nice, huh? And I asked that teacher to let me do the project alone, and I even begged her. Tony could easily be placed with another group, and she ended up doing it. I avoided all the boys from then on, insisting on working alone or with girls if that was possible, and the teacher thought that I feared boys, but they didn't ask why. And the rest started a rumor about me being a lesbian, and you can probably guess how I was bullied about that. 
but ignoring everyone became my thing. I even ignored anyone who tried to be nice to me. They had broken me after all those years with that stupid bathroom encounter, and perhaps it wasn't them, but others who didn't care about me, or it could have been my mother's attitude. Either way, I just felt shattered inside. You're probably waiting for some revenge that I got, but I didn't get one. There's a silver lining, though. At 18, I left my house and went to college. I found friends, still introverted, and finally shaved wherever I wanted. I dare say that I became pretty to myself, which was a big accomplishment considering how I felt before. And as for Janice, Guy, and Emma, I think they're living good lives, for the most part. And that's not what most people like to hear, but that's real life. Maybe karma will get them one day, but maybe not. When I was a little kid, I had a best friend, and his name was Paul, and for a while, it was awesome. I didn't have the best time at home. My parents were very strict. I understand that they were trying to raise me well, but my father's military career made it hard for me to be who I was. My mom just followed his lead, so I often felt like I was alone in the world until I found Paul. With a military dad, we moved around a lot, and I didn't have the chance to make a lot of friends. Paul was my neighbor. It was like he took me under his wing and we became best friends almost immediately. And I thought he was pretty cool too. He had a lot of freedom at home. His parents let him go out wherever, whenever, even though we were like 14 and freshmen. And he introduced me to a lot of stuff that I probably shouldn't have been watching. But I was growing up and interested. My parents would have killed me if they knew. I felt freer thanks to him, which is why I didn't notice for some time that things weren't so normal with Paul. At school, we sat at the same spot every day and hung out with the same people, Paul's friends. He was sort of a leader to them too. The first time I noticed something off was the day after we had a little project in class where I met this cool guy from the chess club who liked a bunch of music and movies and books that I had no idea about. And I was a very curious kid, so I just kept talking to him. We went together to the cafeteria during our free period and kept talking about his taste in music and more, and I was pretty riveted. Paul must have entered the cafeteria without me noticing. And out of nowhere, I felt this pull on my shirt and turned to see his very angry face. He asked what the hell I was doing sitting there with that loser. And I didn't know what to say. My new friend was shocked and a little scared and I had no idea what to do, so I let Paul drag me back to our regular table and nothing else was mentioned for the entire free period. But I wasn't an idiot either. When we were alone at school, I asked him why he did that, and Paul managed to convince me that I had to watch out with whom I spent some time with. I couldn't be seen with some loser kids from the chess club. Paul said that if I wanted to be a loser too, then he wouldn't be my friend anymore, and that was very terrifying at that age. I couldn't conceive of not having Paul and his friends as my friends after years of not having anyone to rely on, and so I agreed and stopped talking to that guy. The next incident happened a few weeks later when Paul invited me over for some TV and games and there were two girls there. I knew them from school, but this was the first time I hung out with girls in such a private setting. I asked what we were watching and Paul made us look at this X-rated stuff on his TV. I don't know if the girls were comfortable with that, but they didn't seem to say a word. And at one point, Paul called me to the kitchen and said that he was going to his room to make out with one of the girls. I told him, fine, but I was tired and wanted to leave. He got this angry look again and told me that I wasn't leaving. I was staying and making out with that other girl. I said I didn't want to. Yes, I was 14 with raging hormones, but I didn't want a make-out session with some random girl that night. Paul said that I had to go and kiss her right then with him watching. Otherwise, I could go home and just never talk to him again. All of this just felt so unfair, but that threat again was enough to just get me moving. The girl seemed to be into it, or maybe she was just trying to fit in like I was, but we did kiss and it was my first kiss, but nothing like I imagined or wanted. 
I definitely wouldn't have picked for Paul to be there commanding this entire thing. I kept kissing her until Paul left for the other room with the other girl and I pulled away and told the girl that I was leaving and she said that she wanted to leave too. And she and I actually never talked again but Paul told all the guys in our friend group about it and made me out to be some sort of hero for kissing this chick and I didn't like that but at least he was happy and I guess we were still friends. Little things like that continued to happen but at some point Paul stopped threatening me with his friendship and he actually started hitting me instead. It was small in the beginning, like a nudge on the shoulder that hurt a little too much for comfort, wasn't very friendly. He hit me in the back of the head when I wouldn't move fast enough for his liking, and my shins also took some kicks from him. And the things that he was asking for, like sneaking a bottle of vodka out of a store, got worse and worse. I don't want to paint my teen self as the most innocent person in the world. I knew I was doing something wrong, and I still did it. It's hard to even remember what it was like or why I felt compelled to do what he wanted. Yes, he hit me, but it was like a trance that you can't get out of. I once pulled a girl's skirt right off of her in the middle of the quad because Paul asked me to. Actually, I did that completely hoping that I would get in trouble, that the school would call my parents. If my dad had found out about it, he would have forbidden me from ever going out until I turned 18 and left his house. I wanted to get in trouble. I didn't think that there was another way to get away from Paul, but I didn't actually get in trouble. No teacher had seen it, and when I asked about it, Paul told me that he talked to the girl. He said, you know I got your back, right? As long as you and I are a team, nothing will ever stop us. I smiled, but I just wasn't happy about it. Paul's demands and his requests increased, and I swear that I tried to refuse, but he was full on hitting me by that point, and those were times when no one else was around. One night, Paul told me that we were going to steal a car and we could go joyriding. I said no, full stop. We were 15 then, and I knew that he would want me to drive, and if caught, I would be the one to get in trouble. I was tired of his tyrannical ways. Paul started hitting me as always, goading me, hurting my shins, and I still wouldn't do it. He got angrier and angrier until all of that rage just exploded in some serious meltdown, but also a beatdown from him to me. In the moment, I tried to protect myself from the blows, but it wasn't easy. Something had been unleashed, and it wasn't until some guys in some truck parked nearby yelled at us that he stopped and fled. I was fine mostly, just kind of bruised up. I managed to go home and to school the next morning without being seen by my parents, but the teachers and others noticed it in my face. The staff thought that I was being hurt at home, and my homeroom teacher took me to the principal. I just followed along because I didn't want to see Paul, and I only saw him from my side eye with his arms crossed as I walked into the principal's office, but I just kept walking. The school called my parents, and I still smile remembering how that principal, Mr. Perez, and the school counselor faced my intimidating father. They said that they would call CPS and the police to have him arrested, and my mother started crying, and that was when I told them the truth. And I just broke down, telling them how I had felt about being Paul's friend and the subject of his bullying. The meeting wrapped up, and I was sent home for the day. I anticipated getting scolded by my father, but seeing me crying like that affected my dad. He talked to me alone in my room and listened without his usual attitude, and I had never felt a real connection to him until that point. He comforted me in his detached way and told me that I didn't have to worry about Paul again. We were moving again for his new posting, and I swear, I had never felt so good about that news. I didn't say goodbye to a single person at school, and I guess I'll just do it here now, even if years have passed by. Goodbye, Paul. I hope to never see you again. Doing nothing against bullying is almost worse than the act itself. I thought I hadn't done anything to this boy, 
and I even forgot about him for years. I rationalized it for sure, but it's been killing me and I want to know how much I should blame myself now. So, bullying is normalized in our society and when the victim fights back, he's the one who gets in trouble. But this kid, Andy, didn't fight back at all. Imagine the typical scenario from a movie, a scrawny freshman boy gets tormented by the senior jocks. I was a senior then. It's a cliche for a reason because it has happened often and will continue to happen no matter how many generations pass. In the locker rooms, in the hallways, and in class, Andy was teased relentlessly. He was beaten whenever he couldn't get out of school quicker than the seniors, and no one batted an eye even when he literally came to school the next day with bruises and black eyes. Actually, we laughed. I think there was only one teacher who tried to do something, but I can't be sure. I think I saw her being lectured by one of the coaches one day, but they could have been talking about something else. The fact is, nothing ever came of it, and everyone continued to let it happen. I think even Andy's parents didn't care, because my mom would have raised hell if the same thing happened to me. And looking back, I wouldn't have blamed him for literally snapping and doing something terrible to everyone. He didn't, and the worst of the bullying happened after the final pep rally for the football team in our senior year. I don't know why Andy attended that rally. I mean, it literally was an event to celebrate his biggest tormentors, who I'm ashamed to say that I considered my friends then. I guess that's another clue that Andy's life at home wasn't that great. Maybe he didn't have anything else to do, so he just stayed as long as possible that day, but he shouldn't have. The pep rally came and went. When everyone left, most of the senior class returned to the school for this big secret party. We weren't exactly a small town, but partying anywhere else with booze and other substances wouldn't have been easy. School was their only option at the time. We drank way too much, but I stopped before I could get too drunk. I was also more preoccupied with a girl, but during a break from our kissing and makeout sessions, one of the guys, Carlson, pulled me toward the rest of the team and we started talking about the senior prank. And it had to be epic. The upperclassmen in our school were famous for pulling fun but smart stuff that never got them in trouble. These guys were suggesting things that could get us arrested, and I told them not to be idiots. We couldn't jeopardize the final game of the season or our graduation, so no, stealing all the final tests for the entire high school wasn't an option, and neither was destroying the principal's car or driving it into some body of water. I had to remind them several times that the idea was for it to be fun, smart, and not get us expelled. They laughed, but saw the wisdom of my words, so I suggested other ideas, but we weren't planning anything serious then. A friend Walter arrived just as we were talking about streaking with masks through the school parking lot on a random Monday. I would say that he was the biggest bully in the team and the entire senior class. He was huge and had rich parents and influence, so basically untouchable in my mind. We had all assumed that Walter had sneaked off with a girl to hook up, but he came back dragging Andy with him. He starts saying things like, look what I found, and everyone was jeering even me. I knew something bad was going to happen, but I still just laughed like some hyena when I saw that little kid. Walter said that he had an idea for the senior prank, and it was all going to be focused on Andy. I kind of stopped laughing then. I tried to tell them that doing anything to Andy couldn't really be the senior prank, but with Walter being there, all the others just stopped listening to me. Now, Richie... He was the mascot on our team and he was a lion, pretty athletic kid, and he had grabbed it from wherever it was stored. And he said, let's dress him up, and Walter loved this idea. Everyone cheered again, and as we forced that little kid into a big lion costume, Walter made him crawl on all fours and roar for some time while the rest of us just watched. Then, we started throwing beer at this kid. Well, the costume, I guess but either way, it was pretty degrading. Walter kept yelling for him to growl and growl and growl, and we all shouted it too. And after a while of this, I noticed that the girls had gotten bored and most of them left without us. Maybe it was because we had stopped paying attention to them. Parties without girls really don't make any sense in my mind, so I told the guys it was probably time to leave too. 
and that's when they noticed the girl's absence. Carlson told Walter everyone was leaving, but Walter stopped us, said something like, No, we have to finish our senior prank. And I asked him what more he would want. He played with the kid all year and pretty much all night, basically. He told us to follow and dragged Andy, who was still in that lion costume, to the shower locker room. I followed along with Carlson, Richie, and the two other guys, so not everyone witnessed what had happened. Walter grabbed some rope from I don't even know where and tied Andy to one of the showers. We had this system where the pipes were in the middle of the shower area like columns, so it was easy to tie him up. And then Walter turned on the water, and Richie complained because he would get the blame if the costume was completely ruined. I was pretty uncomfortable in that moment too, but Walter didn't listen to Richie or I. He soaked the kid, who remained motionless in his spot. And I shiver right now thinking about it back then because it felt like he was more than just tied to the shower. And he was defeated or resigned to Walter's bullying. This kid was just completely gone. I remember Richie finally said something like, that's it, I'm done. If anyone asks about this, I'm putting the blame on you, Walter. And Walter hurled some insult at him and just kept going. Carlson was also worried, telling him to stop and just untie him. And he told Walter, but Walter was just in some frenzy by this point. And honestly, I don't think there was any stopping him. He shut the water off and I thought, finally. But then he unzips his pants and that was it for me. I asked him what the hell he thought he was doing, but it was too late. He started peeing on this kid, and he was laughing, telling us to join in on it. I looked at Carlson, and we just shook our heads at how sick all of this was getting. I left then, not caring what else happened. All I knew was that I didn't want to see it. I got home, pretty tired that night, and I just sat in bed thinking how relieved I was that graduation was finally coming and I could just get far away from all of this. So, the pep rally actually took place on a Friday, and when I arrived at school that Monday, there was some commotion and I just knew that it probably had to do with Andy. I even expected the police to be there and actually question all of us. But the commotion was just a bunch of students outside the shower locker room and then I saw a few male teachers carrying Andy out. It was Monday. That kid had been tied to the shower since Friday, and no one noticed. They apparently took him to the hospital, and I swear I was trembling, waiting for something big to happen at that point. I saw my whole future just burning to ashes right in front of my face. But nothing happened. The rest of the day just went on normal. Too normal, I thought, and... I didn't see that kid again. The guys and I kind of came to an understanding. We would never talk about it, sure, and that made sense, but we also pulled a bit away from Walter. That wasn't an understanding, it was just common sense, I believe, something that had escaped us before. And Walter knew about it, and after our last gym class, he laughed and patted our backs, saying everything was fine and saying that his dad would make sure that this didn't go any further. Richie asked him what he meant by that, and apparently, Walter's dad had called the school at Walter's request, telling them that they needed to resolve this issue internally without the police. If they didn't, they made some abstract threat that the teachers would get blamed and not us. At that time, I didn't like this mention of us, the rest of us hadn't really done anything, but I realize now that we were to blame too. Still, I was relieved and I'm not sorry about that. I got dressed quickly and I didn't go out to any more parties, not even after graduation. I left that town for college and put the idea of Andy and Walter just off my mind. But I graduated and moved back to start a business later. And that's when I heard more about what happened to poor Andy. You see, he spent the entire weekend tied to that shower because his parents were away on some business, but also, as I suspected, they didn't really care about him at all. And he couldn't change schools, so he continued going after recovering silently from that torment. And the next few years without Walter were apparently okay for him, but I wouldn't have been fine after that night. 
He apparently saw a therapist and was now on some depression meds. And I was thinking about seeing the kid. Apologizing obviously wasn't enough, but maybe it would help. Except then I saw Richard the other day and he told me that Andy had taken his life a year after he graduated. Richie wasn't sure what happened, but we all knew one thing. Walter never moved away. He worked for his father, even without a college degree, and Richie thinks that Walter never actually stopped tormenting the kid, but he just wasn't sure. Now, I know none of the guys from back then maintained a friendship with Walter, and does that mean we grew up? Does that mean we all knew that it was wrong? The thing is, I don't think any of them, not even Richie, are living with the guilt. And I don't mean to make this all about me, but there have been times where I just can't sleep. Could I have stopped this prank from going any further, and how much of it truly does fall directly on my shoulders? My family moved to the smallest town I'd ever seen during the middle of my sophomore year. There was only one high school, and it became apparent real quick that most people there had known each other forever. I stood out like a sore thumb from the very beginning. I was deep into my punk phase and only wore black and leather, whereas the others were only in jeans and usually a t-shirt. Think city boy versus country folk. I didn't think that would make them hate me. In previous schools, I wasn't popular by any means, but blatant bullying was not the norm either. You'd get insults from others who thought that they were better than you, and I saw the girls being mean to each other and the popular group ruled, but it was like they didn't care about others enough to even really escalate to actual bullying. In this new school, anyone who stood out was a big no-no, but what made things more difficult for me was that I didn't have a single person to blame for the torment that I was receiving, but let me get to explaining how the bullying actually began. If I had left a class for the bathroom or whatever, I would return to my book bag turned inside out and all my belongings scattered all over the floor. I rolled my eyes at that and asked who did it, and people would just laugh, and I even asked our teacher. That was Spanish class, so I remember it was Miss Paloma and she said that she didn't see anything, but it was the middle of the lesson. They couldn't have done it without her seeing it, and that day, I arranged my things and acted like nothing was wrong. Now, several days later, someone broke into my locker, added a little stink bomb in there, and destroyed some of the pictures that I had added to the door. I didn't get how no one saw anything, but I guess they could have done it when the hall was empty. I tried to tell our main teacher... Mrs. Frankson, but she told me to ignore it and that nothing else should happen. I told my mom about it and she thought the two teachers that I had talked to and the fact that they weren't more worried about it seemed very strange, but I wasn't ready for her to come to school and make some scene. Sometime later, someone stole my leather jacket. I shouldn't have left it lying around after what they'd done before, but the weather was weird that day. I got hot and distracted and suddenly it wasn't on the back of my chair where I left it. Unlike the other stuff, this was a $300 jacket, a Christmas gift from my grandma. I made a big scene and I stopped Miss Paloma's class, demanding to know where it was. The teacher saw how the others were snickering and yet she didn't do anything. She said she was sorry but unless I knew who, when and how it was taken, it was my fault for misplacing my stuff. And I couldn't believe it, and I wasn't going to let it go. I went out and straight to the assistant principal. They told me the principal was busy with something, and I explained everything that happened and how my very expensive jacket had been taken. Once again, I had this weird reaction. Another adult who didn't care, or had been trained not to care, and it just all felt seriously wrong. The lady asked me who took it. I said I didn't know. Then she said that I probably lost it myself, and I was speechless. No, I didn't lose it, I told her. I placed it on the back of my desk chair and went up to talk to Miss Paloma about sentence structure. When I returned to my desk, the jacket was gone. The assistant principal repeated the same thing as Miss Paloma. She couldn't do anything if I couldn't tell her who had taken it. And that was it. 
I was ready to call my mother and get her to come here. You may call me a mama's boy or whatever, but that jacket meant the world to me. And when I went back to class, the jacket was back on my desk chair. And I heard the laughing and saw their smirks. And I was not only being bullied, I felt like I was being gaslit. Miss Paloma was oblivious as I went to my desk, put on my jacket, and sat quietly, fuming. I felt their stares and tried not to react, but I couldn't contain my rage fully. But what could I do? I had no one on my side. The teachers were either apathetic or in on it, and I had no clue and no other options. Something similar happened a few days later. I was showering after P.E., and when I finished, my clothes were gone. I tried not to panic, wrap my towel around me and walk the entire bathroom trying to find them. Others were there, waiting for what I would do, and waiting to laugh as well. But I tried not to act mad or desperate, I tried not to fall into this obvious bait. One of the football guys, this guy named Jackson, talked to me directly and he asked, what was wrong, you looking for something? I ignored him and kept looking. Jackson kept going and asked if I needed to borrow some clothes, and I straightened my back and just said yes, that would help. He sighed dramatically and said that he would, but all his extra clothes were in his other locker. When I knew his game, I asked if he could go get them for me, and Jackson laughed. He said, no, you can look for them yourself. He gave me his locker number and even the combination, and then he said, good luck and the rest of the guys left the bathroom looking at me like they had a secret up their sleeve. They left me alone as a test of what I would do. Would I stay here and keep looking, knowing full well that they had hidden my clothes somewhere that I wouldn't find them? Or would I go in my towel and barefoot to be ridiculed by the school? While I contemplated those options, I also considered what their game was. How should I face them? Did they want fear, compliance, defiance? Would they respond to show of strength? I didn't know, but I decided on that. With my head held high, I stepped out of the bathroom in barely anything, and I was expecting a few people, but it seemed like the entire student body had gathered for this. Granted, it was a small school, but they all witnessed this walk of shame. I didn't look at Jackson as I walked to his locker and tried to open it. It was only then that I grasped that he didn't really give me his combination, and I felt like an idiot. I should have known that he wouldn't have helped me, but I tried the lock again and failed. Suddenly, our principal called my name and asked why I was naked in the middle of the hallway, and I tried to tell him what was going on, but he wouldn't listen. He said that he had no idea how I behaved in the big city, but this was a good school, and I needed to start behaving, and I just lost my temper. I yelled that his great students had stolen my clothes, and I invited him to the bathroom with me to find them. You can probably guess what happened next. My clothes were sat right on the bench where I left them before, and I remember I even started crying openly then. It was just pure frustration. I had been humiliated so massively, and the principal gave me detention instead of trying to see my side of things. I couldn't report any bullying, not just because of the awful teachers, but also because I had not seen anyone doing it, again. This cooperative bullying effort made it impossible for me to accuse anyone, so I couldn't tell my parents, what would I say? I used to think that people who didn't snitch on their bullies were idiots. Snitching was better than taking the abuse, but in this case, I literally couldn't snitch. The only thing I could do was just take it and wait. I became a lot more vigilant after, I locked everything and kept an eye on all of my things in school. For days, nothing happened and I got this idea. If I could catch someone in the act, I could report them. So I pretended to get sloppy again. One time I left my locker slightly open and went into the boys' bathroom right across from it. I acted completely normal, but hid behind the door and waited. No one came and class was starting, so I went out. Still acting normal, locked everything and continued my day. I thought that maybe they didn't want to repeat their taunts on me. They could have wanted something new to up their game, so at the risk of my own health, I tried something else. I got the same food I always did for lunch and sat at one of the tables outside where everyone ate their lunch. The school didn't have a cafeteria per se, 
You could get food, but it wasn't a whole building like you see on TV. Now anyways, I pretended to get a call and stood and walked away from my table for a second and I talked on my phone for a while. My back was to the food, but I was fully aware of any movements nearby. I even saw my chance and stood closer to the building's windows to give me a better view. It wasn't perfect because of the several plants that surrounded it, but I could see much better than just my periphery. And at last, I saw Jackson and four others, people I'll call Marcus, Jerry, Zeke, and Max, get close to my table, and I waited for a second. I didn't believe my plan to catch them would work, but finally I had faces and names that I could report for bullying. I was still pretending to talk on the phone while considering my options. And that's when I saw them trying to put something in my food. And for once, luck was on my side because Miss Paloma was walking by. I rushed back, stopped her in her tracks and pointed at the guys. They're putting something in my food, Miss Paloma, I remember screaming. The guys seemed too stunned to react and the teachers saw the bottle in their hands. She went to them and told them to hand whatever they had over. Jackson pretended it was nothing and the others backed him up, but I insisted. I even spoke like a total goody two-shoes, detailing exactly what happened, and they were forced to give Miss Paloma the bottle and I saw what it was. It was this very strong laxative. Not very original, but it was what I was hoping for. Concrete proof. You boys follow me to the principal office, she said, and that included me. And I finally felt vindicated almost elated, like I had won some lottery. I sat down with the principal and this time I had a chance to air out all my grievances, everything that had been happening to me once I started school. I didn't blame the staff for their indifference because I was trying to win them over to my cause. The principal asked the guys if they had done all of those things to me and they muttered some no's and yeah, I couldn't prove their involvement before but the laxative was as clear as day. The principal said that they didn't tolerate bullying at the school, and that's funny because no one seemed to care before, but they called everyone's parents and it was this very big thing. I fessed up to my parents about my school life. I added all the details I couldn't say anything about before and how I finally caught the guys, although I left out the part about that being my plan. My mother made a big fuss about it, the other parents weren't happy, but I was delighted that adults finally saw things and wanted to solve it. The principal even lifted my detention from that towel incident, and I spent that weekend happier than ever. My other problem came later, though. I had already been designated as an outcast, so it's not like I lost anything, but at least people talked to me. I had interaction. When I returned to school the next day, no one would even look at me. The teachers were fine, they were always somewhat detached anyway, but everyone else didn't deal with me. I didn't exist to them. At P.E., people avoided me. They didn't throw balls or laugh or accuse me of being a snitch, and I just became invisible to them. And after school, I stayed a little back to talk to another teacher about some homework, and when I walked through the hallway, I saw the five guys. I almost tripped not knowing if they were going to do something, but I kept walking and they just let me. I sneaked a look back and they went into the classroom used for detention without a word or a glance in my direction. I was confused. I spent an entire month waiting for something to happen, but nothing ever did. I waited some more and tried to speak to others, but I was met with silence. The rest of my sophomore year was a silent nightmare. It was almost worse than being taunted or teased. I didn't exist to these people, and I couldn't understand that attitude. And faced with the idea of having to live like that for two more years, I talked to my parents, and they found a private school an hour away from our town and told me that they would pay for it if I could handle the commute, and I did so gladly. It was the best choice for me, I didn't make many friends there, and it was an entirely different atmosphere. I wasn't popular, but I wasn't a pariah either. But to this day, I still get a little scared of the silent treatment, even from people I don't particularly care about.
I didn't realize how hard it would be to move to an entire different country. My family came to the United States in the 1990s. I was 10 and I barely spoke English. My parents made me believe that there were many other Latin American kids in Florida, but we ended up in an area with mostly white people and I started only knowing simple things like my name is, I'm 10 years old and I come from X country. I knew I could learn quickly though because I had always been a good student back home. But at my age it was very likely that I would always have an accent. I was also browner than my peers and I got strange looks. And despite what you may see in many movies, most countries in Latin America are pretty diverse. We have everything from blue-eyed blondes to the darkest skin color. And some places have different or more varied ethnicities, but the point is that I had been exposed to all kinds of different people already. I never gave that difference a second thought, and that wasn't the American experience. My new schoolmates had obviously grown up without any exposure to other people or foreign cultures, and I slowly had to learn the rules of this country when it came to race and other issues, and this was a big culture shock altogether. During my first days, all I got were strange looks and a few interested, friendly gazes, most of the teachers were nice and tried to help me, although I couldn't understand them much in the beginning. Some girls tried to talk to me, and we laughed while making hand gestures. They taught me a lot, and those girls became my best friends for the rest of my school life. But as I spoke more English with my accent, I realized that not everyone wanted to be my friend. As I grew up and noticed more about the world, I theorized that those kids were most likely influenced at home about me. I know now that I was thoroughly correct. Every kid seemed merely curious on my first days. Looking back and remembering how that curiosity changed to hatred is pretty difficult. Children aren't born with that prejudice. It's imparted and some adults have no idea how horribly they're damaging their kids' minds. As I got braver with my language skills, I spoke more in class. But one time I had heard mocking for the first time ever. Someone repeated exactly what I had said to the teacher, but with a bit of a lilt and fake accent, and others laughed. The teacher reprimanded them, but they did it sporadically, and I started hearing it at recess. My mom told me that I shouldn't listen to them, that they were just jealous because I could already speak two languages, and they only knew one. And her words made me feel better, and the next time it happened, I used that logic as a sort of retort, I told the girl who did it that she was envious, but she had something to say too. Who wants to speak Spanish? Ooh, that's for poor people. And her friends laughed, and I started to tear up. The teacher sent her to the principal's office, but that didn't deter her. She mocked me whenever she could and kept getting in trouble. Her mother came to school once, and I was told that she ranted about the foreign kid who was getting her daughter in trouble. She was even changed to another class to be far away from me and her friends still tried to mock me whenever they could, but they couldn't do it inside our classroom after a while. The rest of my classmates had gotten bored. You can only make the same mocking joke a couple of times before people just don't find it funny anymore. The girls weren't happy that I was making more friends and even the boys liked talking to me and asking me questions. I'll call my main bully here Sarah and her friends really don't even deserve a name. They were just sort of her minions. The worst of her bullying started at one recess. I was playing on the playground with my other friends, and there was this tunnel. It wasn't a slide because it was straight, but I loved it. I went through it, following my buddy Anna, who had just gotten out. I was about to go out when Sarah blocked the opening. She asked me where I was going, and included a word that I hadn't heard before, and I learned later... It was actually a slur. While I didn't know the word, I knew that it wasn't well intended. I went back and saw her minions at the other end, and out of nowhere, they were starting to throw rocks at me inside that tunnel. I covered myself as best I could as I cried out for help while I heard them shout, Go back to your country, repeatedly. It, f <sighs> it felt like I was trapped, getting that hate for hours, but... It was less than a minute before several teachers pulled them off and got me out of that tunnel. 
I had a few scratches, but I was mostly rattled emotionally. They called my mom, who couldn't fight for me much with her broken English, but she made a lot of noise. Sarah's mother came and acted up again, but the teachers told her off, and Anna and some others told everyone what Sarah and her minions were saying about me. No one was happy, and it was a huge mess. And it may sound trivial, but that incident coupled with all the mocking before shook me to my core. I was old enough to know that things weren't like that in other places. I cried to my mother that night that I wanted to go home, to our country. And I had good friends, but I was honestly scared of having to live like that for the rest of my life. We couldn't go back home. My parents had sacrificed so much to move here and to give us a better life. My mom explained that to me when I stopped crying. I understood and decided to be stronger, and still some of my sparkle had left at that point. I went to school and stayed as far away from Sarah and her friends as I could. I never used that tunnel again and I practiced like hell to make my accent completely disappear. You can still tell that English isn't my native language, but it's not that obvious. When I didn't stand out as much as before, Sarah left me alone for the most part. She grew up to be one of the most awful people you could really meet. High school had more diverse students and she hated them all. She looked down on anyone who was a little bit different and not just race wise but another aspect and she used some really terrible names to describe them. And she hated me still, but that's because I grew up to be conventionally pretty good looking and decently popular with boys and girls and teachers alike. I had a big group of good friends though and a solid backbone. I thought I was over that tunnel by high school, however I later realized that she had done something to me that really stayed with me for a long time. For many years I separated myself from my culture, I ate only what other kids ate and I tried to avoid speaking Spanish outside my family. I told any new person I met that I was born here and I did a lot to hide who I truly was and I believe that that was Sarah's doing. She introduced me to hatred and made me fear my background, the core of my being and my connection to my family. But when I noticed what she'd done, I changed. And as soon as I could save up enough money, I took my parents to visit our home country, reuniting with other family members and learning what I had missed about myself. I brought clothes, souvenirs, pictures, and more into my house. And I celebrate who I am just as I celebrate being an American citizen. Neither Sarah nor anyone like her will ever take that away from me again. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday and Thursday at 7pm EST, and there are super fun live streams on Sundays and Wednesday nights. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, or send it over email, and maybe you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, I'm deleting my channel. April Fool's.